sometime into Jesus' ministry, he made a powerful statement concerning a person's allegiances and allegiances that would impact their relationship with himself. In Matthew 10, 37, Jesus stated, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus was referring to the closest of human relationships. And he was saying that one's allegiance, even to the closest of family ties, must come second place in regards to their allegiance to himself. Allegiance is a term that has to do with loyalty, with commitment, with devotion from one person to another or to another group or to a cause. And the thing about allegiance is that usually if there is a relationship, if there is history, if there is agreement in a common belief or conviction, if there's expressions of faithfulness in that relationship, allegiances are much easier to form. But let's say that you have to make a choice, a choice between one side or another, and if there is no history, and if there are no roots, and if there's no agreement, the choice is pretty easy, right? Allegiances are easy when there's no competition, or when there's little competition. When you have to choose between someone that you know and you trust and you agree with and you like, or someone that you don't know and you don't trust and you don't agree with and you don't like, there's really not a decision, is there? It's pretty easy. But what happens when you find yourself in a situation where you have to make a decision between two parties that you not only like, but you love? Where you feel like your heart is being pulled in two directions, but you can't choose both. You have to choose one. That gets pretty hard. What do you do? Well, it's interesting. I'd encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we're going to pick back up in our passage in Luke 2 verse 39. That Jesus himself, I believe, finds himself in a situation where he has to make a choice in his allegiance. He has to make a choice. And fair warning, this passage, this passage is a unique passage. I've been struggling with it all week. Um, because at, at first glance, if you just brush over it, you say, well, this is Jesus as a child. There's not a ton of application. And the more the Lord's been working on me this week, <clears throat> there's so much application that I feel, I feel like he wants us to get from his word through this passage. And, and just something unique about this is this is the only passage in the Bible that discusses what Jesus was like as a child. Okay, we have other passages where Jesus is born or when the Magi come and present gifts to him and he's probably maybe up to two years old and then Jesus begins his ministry at age 30. And this is the only time in scripture, the inspired word of God, where we see a peak at what Jesus is like and he's 12 years old. And I want us to think about this concept of allegiance. And my hope this morning is that after our time together, you will be encouraged to know what you need to do when God places you in a position where you have to make a decision of allegiance. So let's begin in our passage here in Luke 2, verse 39. When they, and that's Mary and Joseph, had performed everything according to the law of the Lord. Remember, they were just in the temple. They had just uh, presented the offerings, and Simeon comes up, and he holds Jesus, the baby, six weeks old, and he's praising the Lord, and then Anna shows up. So they're still there, and it's talking about Mary and Joseph and Jesus. When they had done everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. Now remember, it seems like in, in chapters 1 and 2 of Luke that every time you see Mary and Joseph, this idea of obedience should just jump off the pages to you. It seems like whenever they are mentioned, <clears throat> they're doing exactly what God is wanting them to do. They're obeying his law. They're following the instructions of the angel. They're doing everything that they wanted to do, that they needed to do, that God had prescribed for them to do. And then in verse 40, it says the child, Jesus, continued to grow. 
That's a big word in this passage. He continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And that, that verse, if it was written of any other person, you would think, okay, God's grace, they're growing. And in, in one sense, that's true of Jesus, but think about this. He's the eternal son of God. Jesus didn't just show up on the scene when he was born in Bethlehem. Jesus has been since eternity past. He is the son of God. Now he probably didn't go by the name Jesus until he became man. He was the son of God. But it talks about him growing. And he's growing not only physically, that's, that's understandable. A human being, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. But he's growing in wisdom. And you might think, how does an all-wise God increase in wisdom? And, and this is one of those where you rest when you think about it. You say, how in the world is he growing in wisdom? Because he's always been God. And I think that when Jesus became a man, Scripture talks about he emptied himself. I think of the independent use of certain attributes. Uh, Charles Ryrie talks about Jesus having the voluntary non-use of some of his divine prerogatives. That Jesus, in his full humanity, needed to grow. He was always fully divine, but there were certain times that he gave up his independent use of his divine prerogatives. So he was growing in wisdom, and he was growing in favor with with God and the grace of God was upon him. And I like the, the front cover of our bulletin this morning. It says every perfect gift is from above or every good gift is from above. And, and when we think about anything that is growing, we should think about that's the grace of God. The grace of God is upon the growth. That, that the, the, the hand of God was upon Jesus, the child. And as he's growing, the grace of God was upon him. Now we fast forward several years, 12 years to be specific, as we continue in verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Again, obedience. They're following the law. The Jews in Deuteronomy 16, it says every man was supposed to go to Jerusalem three times a year. And sometimes they bring their whole family. It seemed like the Passover was, if you were going to go with your whole family to one of them, this is it. So it says that they're going to celebrate the feast of the Passover, verse 42. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, again, they're obeying. They do it. They don't just show up and leave. They stay the full number of days. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan. And they went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and their acquaintances, and they couldn't find him. And you might be thinking, how in the world does a family, how do parents leave their children back in Jerusalem when they're taking a huge caravan of people up. And I'd say that's pretty easy to do. <laughs> it's pretty easy to do in our church. Sometimes we don't know where our kids are and then we see one crawling underneath a pew. We're, tired, we're ready to go. But it, it seemed like from what I've read that when, when families would do these pilgrimages to Jerusalem, to and from, that they would travel in big groups often with the people from their town. And it seemed like, and if this is correct, this makes even more sense, but that the women and children would, would walk in the front. And the men and the young men would stay in the back. And they would kind of see what's going on. And the women and children would set the pace because they may not be able to walk as fast as the men. So the men stay behind. It's kind of like if you've ever been on a hike. You know, sometimes you have a leader in front, but then like the dad stays in the back or the mom stays in the back because you want to see, okay, I don't want anybody left behind. So you've got potentially women and children walking in front and the men and the young men in, in behind. And Jesus was how old at this time? says he was 12. And it seems like in Jewish culture, at least today, it, our modern bar mitzvah occurs at age 13. 
Okay, now that happened after this time in Jesus' era by several hundred years. But it seems like in their culture that a young boy would become a young man in that 12, 13 range. So if Jesus is 12, that means he's right on the cusp of becoming a man in their culture. But if, he, if, if their culture similar idea of age, he had the, the ability to still be considered a boy, but also by some people to be considered a young man. And the thought is that maybe Jesus could have had access to be walking with the other children and the moms up front. But because he was 12, he was almost a man that he also could have been in the back with the dads and the other young men. So it makes sense to me, and, and I don't know this, but as I'm trying to imagine what's going on, that it's very possible that Mary thought, well, Jesus is back with Joseph and the other 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds. And Joseph is thinking, well, Jesus is probably with the other 10, 11, 12 year olds in the front. And we know from other passages in scripture that Mary and Joseph had four sons. And there were daughters, plural. So there was multiple children, probably relatives and kids playing with one another. So it makes very much sense that they lost track of him thinking, well, he's probably with the other parent or he's probably with another parent in the village who's keeping an eye on all these kids. So they, they were unaware that he was not there. And so they went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. They're looking among their friends and their family. Probably bedtime. And one, two, three. We have four sons, right? Or however many children they had at that time. But uh-oh. So then imagine the panic you feel as a parent if you lose your, your child. And imagine the panic that you've been traveling an entire day. And then you're thinking, well, it's too dark and probably too dangerous to go travel back and look for him at night. So... We're going to have to just begin this search in the morning. Can you imagine the, the night that Mary and Joseph had? So then the next morning that they, they start traveling back. Verse 45, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. So if it took a day to leave, it probably took them a day to get back. And then they still hadn't seen him yet. So then they have a second sleepless night probably and, and panicking and frantic and then it says in verse 46 then after three days and I, I take that to mean on the third day it's the third day they had a day of travel a day of back and this is the third day after three days they found Jesus in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers both listening to them and asking them questions and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers so we see Jesus sitting there and listening, and he's asking questions, and he's with the chief teachers of the law at that time in the temple in Jerusalem, but then it also says they were amazed at his answers, which implies not only is Jesus asking questions, but they're asking him questions, and they're amazed at this 12-year-old's answers. And when they, that's Mary and Joseph, verse 48, saw him, they were astonished. I pause here because there's a lot more emotions going on, I'm sure. <laughs> a mixture of emotions. Astonishment, thankfulness, gratitude, praise the Lord, anger, as we're about to see. There's a, there's a whole mixture of emotions right now. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And I can understand if, if that happened to Catherine and I. <laughs> Catherine would say it a lot nicer than me, so she probably would be the one saying it. Why did you do this to us? Now this is where it gets interesting. Because if this was any other child in the world, they would be wrong. But this is the son of God. He has authority over all mankind. So this is a very unique circumstance, and this is a very unusual passage. And let's look at Jesus' answer in verse 49. And Jesus said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? He says, well, 
why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? Literally it says, did you not know that it was necessary for in the things of the father to be me? I needed to be in the things of the father. It was necessary. I must be here. One translation says, I must be about my father's business. Or another translation says, I must be in my father's house. The idea is that Jesus is saying, I had to be spending time with my heavenly father. And I needed to be here. And, and, and he, wasn't, he wasn't yelling at them. He wasn't being disrespectful. I think he's saying, well, didn't you know that I had to be here? And you might say, what does this have to do with allegiances? We just spent a lot of time on allegiances and choosing. Did Jesus, is there evidence in scripture that Jesus had compassion for his family? Absolutely. When he's dying on the cross and he sees his mother Mary out there, he looks at the disciple whom he loved, John, and he says, this is your mother. In translation, take care of her. Jesus is literally dying on the cross, and instead of caring about himself, he's asking God to forgive people. <laughs> he's telling a criminal, you're going to be in paradise with me. And he looks out at his mother, who's probably weeping her eyes out, and he says, hey, take care of my mom for me. Jesus cared for Mary. Jesus cared for Joseph. Jesus loves the world. But Jesus had a choice to make. And his choice was, I needed to be with my heavenly father. See, allegiances are easy when there's no competition. But what happens when a person that you love is going this way, and another person that you love is staying put? What do you do? And Jesus made a choice. So let's see what happens. In verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. Now that, that surprises me in one sense because I think of Mary and Joseph, of all the divine revelation that they'd been given, of, of just even knowing the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin Mary. And, and both of them having received angelic proclamations, and both of them witnessing the shepherds showing up, and both of them probably witnessing these magi from the east showing up probably a couple years later, and knowing the, the, the prophetic blessing of Simeon in the temple. They knew who their son was. They had 12 years of observing their son, who was without sin. As a parent, imagine raising a 12-year-old child who had never sinned in their entire life. It would be both incredibly amazing and frustrating at the same time, right? Because he's always right. <laughs> but it's also amazing because he's always going to obey too. So they knew who he was, and when he says, why were you looking for me? I had to be here. It was necessary for me to be here, to be in the things of my father, to be about my father's business. And they didn't understand. They didn't understand. Now this is incredible too. Look at verse 51. And when Jesus went down with them, he came to Nazareth, and he continued to be in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. That even though Jesus, as the divine son of God, who was fully man, who was growing, which is fully, I, I don't understand how an, uh, an all-powerful God can also be 100% man and growing, but scripture says that that's true. And, and Jesus is growing, and then he chooses to submit to them when he goes back. And Mary treasured all these things in her heart. And I want to push pause on verse 52 for a second. Because I think about Jesus doing what he had just done and staying and he made a choice. Even though his family was going, he stayed in Jerusalem. And then even though the way we think about it, no matter how many times we think about what could Jesus have done? Couldn't he have told them that he was going to stay? Right? Like, why did he, why did he choose to just stay and not say, and, and we'd say with any other child in the world, we would have a different answer, but this is Jesus. He's without sin. So whatever he did was right, and his allegiance was to be with his heavenly father, to spend time in the temple of God learning about his heavenly father. 
That's incredible. Think about the humility of Jesus who was present and involved in the creation of all that there is. Jesus who was present and involved in the revelation of the scriptures that they were discussing in the temple. And he's asking questions and he's learning and he's spending time with his heavenly father. And the way that he responded, there was no uncertainty in his voice. Well, I had to be here. There was no uncertainty of whether he was right or wrong. He knew he was right. This is what I had to do. And I think about his certainty, his surety, his assurance of what he was supposed to do and who he was supposed to be rested in understanding who his heavenly father was. And how many people spend so much of their life not knowing what they're supposed to do or who they're supposed to be because they have no idea who their heavenly father is. Now in one sense, an unbeliever does not have God as their heavenly father. An unbeliever has God as their creator, created in his image like every person. But it is only those who have personally trusted in what Jesus has done on the cross who are received and welcomed in and adopted into the household of faith. Scripture says that every single person who's ever lived has messed up, done messed it all up. We sin. We've fallen short of the glory of God and we deserve God's wrath and his condemnation. We deserve to go to hell and the lake of fire and to be at enmity with God. But God loves us so much that he sent his son to become one of us so that one day he would be an adequate sacrifice for us. So that he would go to the cross and shed his blood to make a payment for our sins. And God loves us so much that he made that offer for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If you have trusted in Jesus as your savior and not yourself, the Bible says you are brought from death to life. You go from being at enmity with God to being at peace with God. You go to being outside of the family of faith to inside the family of faith. You are literally born again, born of the spirit, born of the word and adopted into the family of God. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are a daughter or you are a son of God Almighty, which means he's your heavenly father. And scripture says we have access to him because of the blood of Jesus. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are both interceding for us. And I think that they're saying they're a son, they're a daughter because they've trusted in the cross. And Jesus knew exactly who he was at age 12. And he knew exactly what he needed to do because he knew who his heavenly father was and he made a decision, I'm choosing him. So then, verse 52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now this is an interesting verse because again, it goes to this idea that Jesus was increasing. Okay, And it says that he was increasing in wisdom, that's intellectually, he's growing. And scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. How do you grow in wisdom? You grow in wisdom by fearing God and spending time with him and his word. Knowledge of the Holy One, that's knowledge of God. How do you know who God is? Because you spend time reading whom God said he is in the word. You can grow in wisdom by fearing God and by knowing who he is. Jesus is growing in wisdom. He's growing in stature. He's physically growing as a human being. And, and, and that is probably the easiest of these to understand. Human beings grow. 
We know that, right? But think about Scripture. Scripture attributes God as not only the one who causes growth spiritually, but He's the one who formed us physically. I think of Psalm 139, For you formed my inward parts, you wove me together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Every single person, born and unborn, are created in the image of God and are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God knows how to grow us physically. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Favor with God, I think, spiritually. That there is a spiritual increase in which Jesus was being blessed by God. It says earlier, the grace of God was upon him. That you can grow spiritually. And I think if, if you're just looking at one verse of... I know Bible colleges. We went to Word of Life Canada several years ago. This is their verse for their whole school. They said, we want fourfold growth. We want you to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. We want you to be healthy. We want you to become wise and learn and study the Word. And we want you to grow spiritually. We don't just want you to become smart and know facts about the Bible and you can rattle off Bible memory, Bible memory verses, but that you actually love God. And because you love God, you'll love other people, right? That you will love God, that you can grow spiritually. That you will grow in favor with God and in favor with men. Think about that. There's a great verse in Proverbs 3. It says, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good reproof repute in the sight of God and man. That scripture in Proverbs 3 says that if you cherish kindness and truth and they are ingrained in your life so that there's an overflow of kindness and truth by the Spirit of God, I believe, as a believer, that you will grow in favor with other people by being kind, by telling the truth. Seems very simple, doesn't it? But why do we live in a world where people are not kind? And people don't tell the truth. It says literally, if you bind them and you cherish the kindness and truth, you will find favor in the sight of God and men. I was encouraged this week hearing a story about someone that uh, had not been in touch with someone in a long time. And, and they had heard about another believer. And, and it was like a, a common friend, a common connection. And the person that, that was out of touch for a number of years was encouraged and said, Oh, yeah, that person was really kind to me back in high school. I thought, praise God for a testimony that someone can have with the Lord because of kindness a long time ago. You may never know what God can do in someone's life because of something you did in kindness. 20 years ago, you don't know. Someone may want to come to Jesus because you were kind to them 20 years ago. God can do that. God can do that. How do you grow in favor with God and men, with men? I think having wisdom from God to sometimes choose to lose the battle to win the person. Lose the battle to win the person. To have strength to keep your mouth shut sometimes. I think some of the hardest things in life have to do with keeping your mouth shut. It's easy to keep your mouth open. Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. But sometimes it's hard to keep your mouth shut. I think about Paul in Romans 12. He says, if it's possible, be at peace with all men. If possible, be at peace with all men. There's some people that you will never, they will never like you. That's just the truth. You can never please them. But if it's possible, be at peace with them. If you have wronged them, go apologize. Try to have a clean testimony of good repute in, in the sight of outsiders. You can't control how people feel about you, but you can control how you treat people. And it says, the grace of God was upon Jesus and he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. And then we move on into Luke 3 and we just take off with the rest of Jesus' ministry. 
And you might say, well, this is the weirdest passage in Scripture. Jesus is a 12-year-old. Why did God want us to study this passage? Why is it the only passage in Scripture that has to do with Jesus as a youth? And I think there's many aspects to why did God put it on Luke's heart to, to write this account. One, he was writing to a Gentile Theophilus who wanted to know true doctrine. And I think this passage demonstrates Jesus was clearly human as well as being clearly divine. Right? I think there's application. We as a church can gather of growing in wisdom and stature in favor with God and men that we can apply that. But I also think, too, when you look at a great person in history, when you read biographies of great people in history, you read the biography because you know what the finished product was. But you want to know what were they like growing up? What was their childhood like? What was their relation like with their parents? Or did they have any siblings? Or did they have any hardships in life? And what led them to become the person that they became? I laugh. One of uh, my favorite movies growing up, under the influence of my father, was Davy Crockett. And there's a line in that song that said, Davy, Davy Crockett. And it talks about him killing a bear when he was only three. Well, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Killed him a bar when he was only three. In stories of magnificent people, there's usually mythological legendary things, right? This person killed a bear when they were three. This person turned water into wine when they were ten or whatever, right? But you know, that's not what the Bible has in this account of Jesus. You know what it shows in this account? It showed Jesus submitting to the Heavenly Father. And he making a choice between people that he loved most in the world and saying I have to choose my heavenly father first and then what's amazing to me is that Jesus is 12 years old and he doesn't start his ministry yet he had to wait another 18 years 18 years before he starts his ministry sometimes God's work in our life takes time and if that happened with Jesus then why should we expect it to happen, presto, for us? See, Jesus came onto the scene at 30 years old. And when I look at Jesus at 12 years old, I say, he's ready. <laughs> he knows who he is. He knows who his father is. He's ready to go. But in God's perfect plan, he still needed to wait another 18 years for it to be the father's time. And of all the things we could have learned about Jesus as a young man, we see humility, we see submission, we see allegiance. And I said, my hope for you after studying this passage today is when God puts you in a situation, you'll know what to do when you have to make a choice of allegiance. And I don't know what your situation is. Maybe it has to do with a relationship, a friendship, or maybe their influence upon you for the negative is stronger than your influence upon them for the positive. And God's trying to tell you something. What do you need to do? Or maybe it has to do with something in your job. And everybody else in the business. And everybody else is obeying the boss and doing the thing that's illegal and unethical. But you know in your heart that the Lord is instructing you to not do that. Whose side are you going to choose? Or maybe it has to do with how you parent your kids. When everybody's saying, this is what you got to do, this is what you got to do, but you and your spouse are convinced and have prayed before the Lord, you know, that's great for them, but we feel like we need to do this. What are you going to do? Maybe it has to do with how you spend your money or how you spend your time. When you have a choice to make, whether you're going to go with everybody else or before God alone, you say, I'm choosing him. What are you going to do? You know, Scripture is full of people that had to make choices. I love two of them. We'll close on this. Joshua with the people. Joshua 24. He's standing there with the people. He says, you all make a decision today. Who are you going to go with? You want to go with the gods of your fathers across the river? He said, you make your choice, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Planted a flag there. He said, we're making a choice. Our allegiance is with the Lord, Yahweh. 
I love Peter and John in the book of Acts in chapters 4 and 5 are proclaiming the name of Jesus and he's raised from the dead and the leaders didn't like that. They said, stop talking about this. Stop teaching in this name. And they said, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you or not, we cannot stop preaching and teaching about what we know, what we have seen and heard. And then in chapter 5, Peter and John say, we must obey God rather than men. Who are you going to choose? One of my favorite pastors and authors is Charles Stanley. And he's got an amazing, he's got an amazing quote. The motto of his life, he's I think 87 years old, he's been pastoring for almost 70 years. And the, the theme motto of his life is obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Can we do that? Will you do that? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you what we have learned about your son, Jesus, even as a 12-year-old, demonstrating incredible submission to you and allegiance to you. And for all those who are believers right now, I ask that we would have allegiance to you, that when we are being pulled in separate directions, we would have a firm conviction that we are going to choose you that we will choose what you have revealed in your word that we need to do that we will have the humility to look up and the wisdom to see your direction and i believe you have provided that for us in your incredible eternal word lord may we be people of the word who not just know the word but that we do the word that we apply the word and that we would choose to obey you and leave all the consequences to you and for those who have never trusted in jesus in this room right now and you would like to trust in him i like i ask that you would pray with me in your heart and say lord god i'm a sinner i do not deserve your grace i do not deserve to be forgiven but I trust in you and I believe that what Jesus did on the cross he did it for me and his blood paid for my sins and I can be at peace with you and that he was raised from the grave he ascended into heaven he is my God and I'm trusting in him thank you Lord for your grace and if you prayed that prayer you are a child of God and I like all the children of God right now to say thank you Lord in Jesus' name we pray.